Hey everybody, this is Frame by Frame, and uh, this is a little bit of a plug before the show starts. So, here you go. Are you ready? You can find us at iTunes Store by searching for us there, Frame by Frame, separate words, under the podcast category. Look for our logo and then subscribe. You can listen to our podcast directly with SoundCloud, which is at the SoundCloud website, frame by frame two. You can bookmark the website where you can actually find all the above links at roastedportions.com. Follow us on Twitter at frame by frame 78, all one word. And you could also go to frame by frame 78 with the Facebook group and interact with us there on all our exciting little ponderings during the week when we're actually not podcasting. So please check us out, subscribe, follow, bookmark, support, listen, and enjoy. This is Frame by Frame. On with the show. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! You talking to me? Did you have a brain tumor for breakfast? Well, who the hell else are you talking to? Talking to me? No funny how. I mean, funny like a clown. I'm Peter Vink. We all go a little mad sometimes. Man that doesn't spend time with his family can never be a good man. Yeah! Hot. Kind of a big deal. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! And the clock is running! Oh, that snappy one line. Yeah, I don't think I had it last time. I think I missed it in Love and Mercy. Did you? Yes. I can't remember. Yeah, I'm not sure I got it. I was just overtaken by the beauty of Brian Wilson. It was a a one to remember, definitely. It was a milestone episode. Love that. Yeah. What about 80? Listens to it, I think. Have we? I have not checked the stats. Or is it 40? <laughs> is it 40, 80? Well, it's got a little bit of a curl in the number, I'm not sure. But hey, hey, everybody, take a listen. Silence on a podcast, it's great. Yeah, Can no you, children. No children. And I, I feel quite chilled. I feel quite relaxed. I'm not going to be looking over my shoulder to see if... See 85? If, uh, 80, 85? Where am I looking? Oh, I down the bottom what? there. Woo! It's overtaking uh, Insidious within four days. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty good. That's all right. Yeah, who 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 out there is listening? Because we want to know. We want to know who's listening. Why aren't you emailing us? Frame by frame seventy eight at gmail dot com. Get on Twitter. Come on, tell us what you really think, what you feel, what you would like us to talk about next. You know, just throw throw a little bit that's out there. Come on, yeah, come on, come on, come on feel us. Yeah. Uh, as for Facebook, nah. Um, nah so what yeah. are we going to talk about today? Well, I think um, we'll be talking about Mad Max, won't we? It's long overdue, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. We didn't want to jump on the bandwagon like everyone else is talking about Mad Max, so we thought we'd wait till no one's talking about Mad Max, and I thought we'll have a chat about Mad Max. You see, a lot of the lot of the reviews that that, that have come out are looking at Mad Max um, not from a nostalgia st- um, standpoint, which is the reason why Mad Max is out again. You yeah, know, it's a nostalgia film, but a lot of the people who reviewed it. Um, have no clue about what the originals were or what they actually meant right um so i was i've never been excited about a film for for not for a long time right uh, as much as i was with mad max coming out and i've watched it a a, a few times and i really really dig it i really love it yeah i knew i knew exactly what it was going to be and it, it didn't let me down my name is max a road warrior searching for a righteous cause. War boys! Return my treasures to me! We're not going back. Come with us. What do you suppose he's gonna do? Kill him! Mad Max Fury Road, May 15th. It's staggering the, what they've achieved with it. It's visual. It's a visual. Yeah, it's. I mean, um, I mean the. There's nothing. The stunts are incredible. Yeah, I mean they, they really went uh, the, the whole hog with this one. No, there's hardly any uh, kind of CGI really. I mean a lot of the. Yeah, stuff I've is seen practical. some of the sort of VFX shots there on YouTube, and it is like mainly just color saturation. Maybe they put some fire in that wasn't there. 
that kind of thing. There might have been an explosion where they had a close-up of a character that was done in pickups, maybe. Yeah, but when you see a guy jump from one car to another car, a guy actually jumped jump. from one car to another car. It when you see guys fun. strapped uh, uh, to the front fender of a car yeah. and playing electric guitars. With fire billowing out of the top. Wasn't that amazing? <laughs> but, uh, but that's it. One. I mean, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, the colour of it. I mean, uh, we, we've got it... It's just this this pure redness to it. Yeah. It's, it's, the, the hue of it was is, was outstanding. I haven't seen that colour in film, to be fair. Mm. Even what dreams may come come didn't quite get to that. So I mean, they could have done it really bleached out. They could have gone the white sands direction. Yeah, uh, but they didn't. They went really high contrast um, mm. color. Um, but yeah, so what's the concept of this film then? Okay, the the concept is is that um, Max really hasn't changed. I mean, the idea of still of pretty Max, mad, isn't he? Yeah, well, he's. He's not so much mad as internally t- pissed off, you know. Yeah. Um, mad, of course, everybody knows the story of Mad Max. I mean, at the, every, the start of every movie kind of has a bit of a, a voiceover from Max just kind of explaining who he is and where he is and what's going on. My name is Max. My world is fire and blood. Oil wars. We are killing for gasoline. The world is actually running out of water. Now there's the water wars. Water wars. Once, I was a cop, a road warrior searching for a righteous cause. Terminal three gone rogue, terrorizing us. Thermonuclear experiment. The earth is sour. Our bones are poisoned. We have become half life. As the world fell. Each of us, in our own way, was broken. It was hard to know who was more crazy. Me, or everyone else. Yeah. A little bit of a, a preface, you know, just to kind of cover things. Um, when it's a simple... It, the, the thing is, it's very simple. You know, he used to be a cop. Um, so stuff went wrong. I mean, nothing's actually explained as to why they're, they're, it, everything has gone to shit. Mm. But the whole world is obviously just no longer running on dystopian any dystopian future again. It's, it's a dystopian future. I think there was probably a war. I think right. it, I'm I'm kind of guessing war because of, um, at the end of the third film they kind of pass over Sydney and it's just a ruin. Um, but really, I mean, it, it starts off kind of like a normal, slightly post-apocalyptic. It didn't go that far with the first film. It was everybody was still kind of having. There were still gas stations, there were still shops, there was still a life yeah. to be had. Because I remember, it's a while since I've seen the originals, but I remember the first time I watched the very first Mad Max film, thinking it shouldn't be called Mad Max, it should be called Mad Goose. Cause, Mad Goose, because he was the crazy one. He was the crazy one, and it was more about him, really. We know who you are, Brian. We'll see you on the road, Skag! We'll see you on the road like we saw the Night Rider! We remember the Night Rider! And we know who you are. Yeah, and the revenge of uh, of his yeah. death. You know, well, yeah, Goose Goose was very strong. But then there is a duality in these films. It's like in the first film, it was about Goose. In the mm. in the Fury Road, it was about Charisse Theron. Yeah, Fury also. And um, um, with a weird also, eye makeup. Yeah, which was kind of I suppose it's it's to kind of stop herself from burning from the heat. And it's one of those. Uh, and and the Thunderdome was all about um, Tina Turner. Yeah. In a way, and and Master Blaster. Um, and number two. Well, it's the best one uh, of the, the original three. I'd say it was the it was the probably the most uh, interesting of them all. I mean, it had the Feral Kid in it. And yeah. He, and he was incredible that kid. Uh, with his boomerang of death. Um, I, th- I think the second one was more about Max yeah. than it was any other film. I think the other films kind of had a bit of a... He was kind of like observing um, another character going through um, what he did. And I think Mad Max, the first one, was... You know, obviously, Goose dies and um, you know he gets a little bit pissed off, but he really, really uses it when his wife and child get mowed down yeah. by Toe Cutter and his gang. That would annoy you. That would really, really put me on a bit of a spin. Somewhere on the abandoned highways of tomorrow where law is another word for vengeance. I'm going to blow him away. Where 
justice is a forgotten memory. We're 100% snafu! And order lies shattered in the ruins of civilization. I am a rocker! I am a Somewhere up ahead, a hero is waiting. The crack interceptor for the main force patrol. I am the Night Rider! I am the Night Rider! Every life is on the line. And every turn in the road brings you face to face with a new kind of terror. Mad Max. Pray that he's out there somewhere but yeah i mean let's talk about the, the first of all the mel, mel, mel gibson uh, portrayal of max I mean, okay this was kind of like mel gibson's first you know starring role in a yeah, way he, yeah he'd done a couple of things before he'd done um, a lot of tv stuff hadn't he he'd done a, yeah he'd done a lot of um uh, yeah tv movies australian and uh he his first film was actually with steve bisley who played goose um in some uh, in the film summer city and he had his first screen kiss in uh, summer city with Steve Bisley. Yeah, yeah, it was a gay thing, wasn't it? Uh, no, 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 it wasn't a gay thing at all. It was actually a, a heterosexual um, smack on the lips for uh, for the sake of being f fun and goofy. Oh, was that right? Yes, okay. it was a... Um, I think uh, Goose was uh, having a bit of a fondle in a car and um, Mel Gibson comes up to the window and goes... I got your bloody number! Four guys set off on a wild bucks weekend out to make the most of everything and anything. You're the little mark with all the lip, eh? <laughs> if it walks... And talks, they'll be right into it. Chicks, booze, starring John Jarrett as Sandy, who thinks he knows exactly what he wants. Show me ladies like that, and I'll be glad to get married any time. Mel Gibson and Steve Bisley as Boo and Scallop. They know exactly what he's going to get. What a joke. Phil Avalon as Robbie. All he wants is a good time. Uh, but they go surfing and they have a bit of a heterosexual smack on the lips in the back of the car. That's it. So there you go. His first street swing kiss was with Goose. But yeah, so back to Mad Max. And so the, yeah, so the first film is pretty much a, a base, basic plot. You know, there's a gang that are out there causing havoc. All the police force can't handle it. So Max Ratatouille, I've forgotten his last name, um, goes chasing after them. And uh, the he first name's Mad, the second name's Max. Okay, Mad Max goes chasing after this gang, and they, it all turns nasty once the wife and child die, and then he just yeah. that's it. He's going to get them all, including the, the dude who started it all off, and um, you know, and uh, there's that classic line at the end where he's chained to this this car that's that's about to explode, and uh, Mad Max hands him the hacksaw and says, "You've got two choices, mate." The chain in those handcuffs is high tensile steel. It'll take you ten minutes to hack through it with this. Now, if you're lucky, you can hack through your ankle in five minutes. Go. You're mad, man. You think I look silly, don't you? Ha <laughs> ha! Stop breathing on me, man! And then Stop. in the background, you just see it. You don't actually know what choice he made. Okay. And that's a it's a great moment, and it's it, it kind of. So which one was that? That was the first. That was that's the, the very end. That was the last scene in the first movie, and it's just him driving off, and that's it. The and end. does the second film pick up exactly where? It doesn't. The second film basically picks up later on, where the um, I think the 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 second film is about gasoline. This is what it has come to. Look, out there! They're coming back. Here is where it shall be decided. There it is. Greetings from the Humongous. In a world without gas. The Humongous rules the wasteland. I'm gravely disappointed that you wish to take the gasoline out of the wasteland. Defend the fuel. We'll never walk away. Give me the pump. The gasoline. The whole compound. This is a land that prays for a hero. Well, if anyone's gonna get in there, it's gonna be you. 
they all right. wanted it and uh, they were kind of refining it keeping it stored with the, within these little gangs but yeah the second one was probably a, a good 10 years maybe he got a bit of grey a bit of hair he got a dog and uh, he kind of like he lives in his car right. um, and yeah the whole I think the apocalyptic uh, side of things slid downhill um, up to the second film where everybody suddenly became punk um, uh, real neo-punk Right, okay. <laughs> and it's really it's quite an interesting uh, in the second one it's um, like I say it's more Mad Max central yeah um, so, what's the, so what is the the main plot of the second one Max it's a long time since I've seen driving like that man the warrior of the road you're okay by me pal can I hand it to you treasure the last of the V8 interceptors every day we get weaker while they get stronger <laughs> You want to get out of here? You talk to me. Now, to do the job, I need some high octane gasoline. Got yourself a deal. You can run, but you can't hide! You're gonna crash or crash through? I was wrong about you. I'm sorry. When all that's left is one last chance. Pray that he's still out there. Somewhere. Mad Max 2. Max finds himself in the stronghold of, of the opposing gang, who are kind of like the, the, the good people. And he, he kind of promises to help them by driving the truck, uh, by driving the tanker, uh, and doing stuff. stuff that pisses the other gang off I have absolutely no idea what the second film's about okay but but, I, I but does that matter no it, it, but that's the thing it doesn't matter because you can just watch it it's a yeah. spectacle and the, the the plot really doesn't matter and, and, and for a person like me who actually really believes in story plot structure design uh, for me to like these movies is kind of weird because it's very surface mm. but there you go what can you say I think if um, if a film's done well with conviction, I don't think it matters. That's it. You know what I mean? If um, like this, the just new one. As far as I can tell, he's just trying to get away from a load of people. Yeah. And he ends up helping those women escape, don't he? Yeah, he starts. He suddenly has a, um, a motivation to do something uh, to help somebody else instead of helping himself. Yeah. And that, that's what Mad Max is about. I mean, he always starts off his films being, you know, I, I'm in it for myself. Why should I help you? But then there's always like this this nagging thing in his in his mind that there's just I've got to help somebody now. There's a lot of talk with this new one about how pro feminist it is, with Furiosa being such a strong female character. And um, yeah, and I think that uh, I had a context uh, studies teacher back in the college days who would probably say that she had to grow a penis in order to to be that kind of a character that that women uh, can't just be strong without actually being um having guns strapped to them or having that masculinity mm. attached to them and she argued that about Sigourney Weaver having a penis in in, in aliens that she she couldn't just be a woman and and and, and I, I that drove or me like crazy Linda Hamilton in yeah, they they had to suddenly take on the persona of of uh, of a man, but I don't think that's true. I think you take on the persona of somebody who is who is focused. And yeah, it's just and you know. So I I argued with this contextual studies teacher a lot about all this crap that she came up with. Um, but yeah, it's supposed to be with Fury also. She's a strong woman. Yeah, there's no penis envy going on there yeah I mean what, this, what I think what she wants is them to stop off at a bathroom ever so often or yeah, you know look, look for Femidine hygiene products uh, or maybe kind of like after, after a battle they all do have a pedicure and... <laughs> they have to, but, but then that that kind of brings in the sexism of saying well you can't do that because but then you, 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 you de basically they're pretty much de-sexed anyway mm. I mean Max is no different to her yeah. In, in in that sense, they're not looking at each other and going, you know. I mean, he's he's in a car, he's in a truck here, full of women in this last film. So the women he's saving though were the sort of wife to the that bad guy. 
the big bad guy big who bad was guy. Um, ja, uh, Jim Joe Joe Immortal Joe Immortal Joe who, um, very Australian uh, Immortal Joe <laughs> I, I'll tell you what my accent popping up every so often because I'm, when I'm thinking about Australia when I'm thinking Australian you've always Australian done this cinema yeah. I kind of merge into it and I've kind of become you know it's, it's, it's kind of it's just encompassing it just yeah. it, it pulls me in um but yeah, that, uh, the, sorry. Incidentally, the guy who plays Immortal Joe is the same actor who played uh, the Toe Cutter in the original movie, the big right, gang member. Right. And you can tell they kind of look alike. Yeah. You know, it's the same actor. Um, so kudos for him coming on board to do this movie because it it kind of brings it back home. Mm. Um, but yeah, so the, those women are the, are the brides for this for this really creepy ghost like character who is a, a leader of all these people. Um, believe it or not, you know that they actually rely on him for the water. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this one's it's either always it's either about water or gasoline about this, and that's that's kind of the only two things that that mean anything in this. When movie. you're watching this film, you can almost smell the gasoline. It's. But that's why I love it. I think yeah. that's probably why I love it because they really do make the effort to make you really have a sensory overload yeah. um, and no, action films can't do that very often they don't I mean even Con Air you know didn't do that for me you know for American kind of action and that's kind of the nearest thing to a Mad Max film I suppose I think so. yeah I suppose so um, even though it was in the air <laughs> the new Mission Impossible looks like it might be like that yeah a little bit more ro roguish it was called Rogue Nation, isn't it? <laughs> well, but you think go everybody Mission Impossible, someone goes rogue, don't they? Yeah, they have but, to. But yeah. um, have you seen the trailer to it? I have, and he's kind of clinging onto the side of the airplane. He actually did said, that. Wrong door. Yeah, yeah he actually, actually did, did that. Did that. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> he actually did that. So when it turned, obviously it'd be strapped on and safe. Was but Travolta he, he flying? Did that. <laughs> But I like to I like to think I like to think that Travolta was flying because he he, he could then there would be that that bond of trust between them that yeah. hub, uh, that Hubbard was been looking after them. Well, I was reading a, <laughs> a, an interview with uh, Simon Pegg, and there's this scene where uh, well, there's a part in it where there's this really great car chase, and um, apparently, like he said to the stuntman, like, "Are, are you not going to be doing this?" He went, "No, no, no one, no one can drive like Tom," and Tom did the actual car chase. But do you know, kudos to him. I mean, I, I mean Tom, Tom Cruise, he, he gets a lot of flat because of of, of, of of Scientology and all that, and it always seems to come up, and that's the shame that I actually am a part of that, you know, thing. But, you know, when you look I at him... he's an amazing he's a good guy. He's, he's a, a good, good actor, and he gets in there, like, when he's on... What's, what, in that Mission Impossible 3? Yeah. Uh, what's that, the highest building in the world? What's it called? In... Uh, Tokyo? No, it's in uh, Dubai. No, in Dubai. Oh, yeah. The 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 big building thing. Well, they did that with her on the uh, fighting on the outside of it, and he actually did that. This is what I like to see. I like to see the Harold Lloyd of of today. You know, and, and maybe he is the Harold Lloyd of today. Jackie kind of Chan's the Harold Lloyd of today. Is he? Oh, is he? Okay. No, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. But that's why I love Jackie Chan films so much. Because when you see something mental happen, you think he did that. He did that. Have Tom Cruise and Jackie Chan ever made a movie together? No. Maybe they should. I don't, do you think one of them would die? Probably. <laughs> they will be like, yeah, the duel to the death. Tom would do something and then Jackie will have to do something better than that. Yeah, they'll be opening each other. When they did Police <laughs> Story 3, um, Michelle Yeoh did this stunt where um, she ju she jumped off uh, on a motorbike. She, she actually did it herself. She jumped off the side of this thing and landed on top of a train. And Jackie saw it and thought, right, I'm going to have to pull out the bag now. So what he did is dangle from a helicopter without any straps or anything, and got and then went round Hong Kong, just holding onto the ladders of this helicopter. Oh my god! Just to go one. Just further. to go one further. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I like that. I mean, it's it's you know it's healthy. I think in, in film, as long um, as it wasn't saying I'm not having a girl beat me. That's something else. I yeah, hope that. No, 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 no. I don't think he would. Uh, he's not like that. I don't think sure. so. Yeah, he's not Bill Cosby. But that's the thing, um, <laughs> Cosby. Don't get me started. But so, do you think you have that level with Mad Max, the level of the actors? Because w when you see him strapped to the the front of that car, yeah, it yeah. looks like it's him. Obviously, a guy didn't go and hit a, a truck head on. We kind of made a chicken wire version of the tow cutter. Put his helmet on, his uniform on, put the bike up, uh, up on kind of stilts, broke up the bike and uh, 
kind of glued it together with gaffer tape and stuff like that. And then we had the truck. Now, I remember we had such a low budget that the, we, the, the, the truck driver turned up with his truck, his, his rig, and um, he said, I can't smash into that. So we put a plate on the front of the truck, and if you look at it carefully, you can see at the last moment one of the art directors painted on the grill and the headlights. So you can see it's painted, but everyone in the movie's watching the tow cutter as it gets hit. Right. There was a, uh, but a lot of injuries, a lot of, a staggering amount of injuries. Um, in fact, incidentally, Vic Moreau uh, in the Twilight Zone um, it was actually mass uh, was chopped to death by the propellers as it as a helicopter fell out of the sky, killed him and the two children who were with him on the really? ground. Yeah, um, th there was a that was the when he that was, was in the twilight zone. In the twilight zone, the movie when they were going from time frame to time frame. The reason why I mention this is that uh, George Miller directed uh, one of the other films in that uh, in that um, uh, collection of movies. I can't remember who directed that one. If it was Tobe Hooper. Or um, uh, yeah, I want to say Tall Pooper. Does that have the when there's two of them in the car? Is that right? And they say like uh, I, I could scare you or something. Yes, he's that's the one. And then he turns his face when he turns around. He's yeah. like, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's Dan Aykroyd. And yeah, it's Dan Albert Aykroyd. Brooks, that was it. Albert Brooks as well. Um, but then, then you got like four different stories, I think. Yeah. But George Miller directed um, John Lithgow, um, um, something at twenty thousand feet. Um, terror at 20,000 feet or something like that right, okay. it's the monkey on the wing of the plane story um, so he directed that one and I think Tobe Hooper directed the one with Vic Morrell where he's going through different time zones and he in this one this was the Vietnam sequence which was actually cut out of the movie right. completely because Vic Morrell died so they ended up having to tie the story up a bit so, right, okay. um, so yeah I mean people do die doing stunts and people do die do die not doing stunts being a victim of of a stunt yeah um so yeah i mean i can imagine that this film probably had they had a lot more control because they had a lot of money as well to kind mm. of make sure that the safety precautions were in place the first the first two films they didn't have so much safety and, and they just had really 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 good people doing the work yeah well the tanker roll you know that was the climax of the movie and I was worried about the stunt. I'm always worried about hurting somebody. And Dennis Williams, who was a truck driver and also driving the truck, he said, well, I've actually done it in real life. I have rolled a truck in many years on the road. And he did it. And uh, when I saw it and it landed in front of our cameras, I was really, really, really happy. And if you look at the movie too, there's a moment when the door gets ripped off. If you look, you'll see Dennis, the truck driver, there between his legs because the gears were getting stuck that's the guy who rolled the truck and that's what i admire i think it, it's you know you've got to admire being able to to make a film as brave as this to not hollywoodize it to keep it yeah keep it australiana i mean australian cinema i mean it, it's for what it is mad max is the one thing that kind of projected it forward Mad Max really made it put Australia on the map for a place to make films. Um, it, it gave it a unique look and a feel, and a unique accent that everybody kind of was fascinated with. And I think it just projected it. Yeah, because really, there's not a great output of Australian cinema. Well, Australian cinema, uh, in in historical, when you look at it historically, it, it was the f it was actually making movies. Uh, full feature length movies silent movies before Hollywood mm. um, which is quite astonishing you know they were actually doing the features before Hollywood actually jumped aboard then Hollywood became big it became this thing and then everybody in Australia started to just keep buying over because they were cheaper to buy and they yeah. weren't they start, they kind of weren't making so much the majority of the Australian films uh, up until America um took over with Hollywood were kind of pioneer films about uh, a you know the, the James Cook the, uh, the the pioneers of Australia and everybody was kind of like watching that and they got a bit bored because Hollywood started to bring out these glamorous mm. huge spectacles that were fascinating so then Australian cinemas tried to kind of do that and, and uh, throughout the 20s and 30s 40s they were trying to emulate Hollywood but then of course when World War II came along um, they stopped making movies completely unlike Hollywood Cine Sound stopped making feature films until the war was over. 
With Aussie soldiers overseas and the battle to keep spirits up at home, City Sound put all their movie-making money into making newsreels. And so what Australia does is it kind of doesn't have like this 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 line of, of making movies and then a bit of a drop. Literally, it's just a, OK, stop making movies completely. And then the same thing happened when television came out in the 50s. Every Australian said, well, forget the cinema. We're good. It's, it's TV now. We can watch this at home. Of course, during the 1950s, Australian films virtually disappeared. Movie houses went broke across the country as audiences headed home to watch the box. The collapse was so complete, many Australians forgot that we'd ever made films. Cinema literally just stopped until the 70s. Because I listened to a podcast called The Weekly Planet and they're from Australia. Mm. And they openly admit that most Australian movies are rubbish. But it's because they just haven't had a chance to... Uh... Well, they said when they were, were yeah. growing up, they, yeah. it was mainly British TV. They watched like Red Dwarf and The Bill and things like that, you know. That's it. Like I say, but I mean, from the 50s until the 1974, I think, uh, around about that time, where they literally just weren't making hardly any movies. People weren't watching Australian movies. They were watching television. And um, it, it picked up in the 70s. And that, of course... The difference between our film industry and America's film industry and the Australian film industry is that that pure and I look at that it's just incredible staggering stuff is that Australian films are all funded by the government literally they pull all their funding from from government um, f- film funding associations right none of it they don't have studio whoop, they don't have the studio set up any studio in Australia is American funded Right. USA, it's all you know. Um, it's like Fox Studio Sydney. That's that's California. You know, that's that, that's their money. That's their business. But Australian films, purely Australian films, are all funded by the government. And you know, I think they're trying to change that now. But well, that's basically basically the, uh, the history of history. Australian cinema. Yeah, condensed in nut- into five minutes. In a nutshell. Um, but to actually see that and understand it, you kind of get to understand where Australian cinema is and why it focuses so much on the outback. Mm. Why all, all of their most successful films are about the outback. I once watched an Australian film. It was like the Australian Goonies, I think. I tried to pen it, pen it as that. All I remember <laughs> is something called Donkey Gin. Donkey Gin. I don't and it was, it was about... Um, so if you swim in this certain lake, you die, right? And uh, I want to watch this already. <laughs> I just remember it being really good. There was like this folklore against this this um, this, 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 this 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 like reservoir, and um, I just remember that like um, at the end of it, it ended up just being like an old sort of um, truck or something that was under there. And when it sort of came up and went back down, everyone thought it was a uh, like a. Uh, like a monster. Yeah, this is, yeah, this trying, is fascinating. Yeah. Trying to find out what it is. Um, Dirky is a, is a film about um, a kid that flies with his uncle and the plane crashes, and the uh, the uncle dies, and the kid literally has to survive and find his way across the outback on right. his own, which is like Walkabout, which is where you got two children uh, walking across the outback and uh, and. Uh, you know, picking up a friend who's an Aborigine, who uh, the the boy who was actually on Walkabout, and those films just fascinate me. I mean, the thing is, the storylines are impressive. That's just somebody wants to get from A to B to C. That's all. That's all they are. These road movies, like Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, yeah, is just a, very a, good film. a great film. But it's 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 another road movie. It's about characters wanting to get from A to B. It's also the places that. Sparse. Massive, yeah. and then but there's very little population. I yeah. suppose, that, yeah, it makes sense. An Australian movie that's just based in Melbourne is not a very interesting movie because people want to see them go somewhere because it's such a huge place mm. and it's a fascinating place. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is based on that kind of, uh, of, of on the idea of journeys, and I think that probably why a cinema in Australia kind of fascinates me a little bit because of that. Oh, I think I found it. I think he's found it. You see, we actually managed to talk through a moment where we're actually searching for it's a film title. The Quest. <gasps> Cody is an adventurer about to discover the secret of frog dreaming. Gaza, what do you know about a pond five miles east of Devil's Knob? 
to promise me you'll stay away from that pond. Do you believe in monsters? Some for 20 years. I was married to one. I think that could be it, yeah. It's got Henry Thomas from E.T. Yeah. That's... Frog Dreaming. That's what. That's another title for it. And then you've got um, The Quest with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And Roger Moore. <laughs> Roger Moore. <laughs> yeah. Van Damme, Roger Moore. They don't even have to have his full name, do they? Mm-hmm. And then you've got The Quest. Five friends, four days, three nights, uh, two women. Okay. Uh, with a, Very a sexy lady on the front. It's the uh, in the tradition of American Pie, the quest. So yeah, but we'll we'll see if we can find that Australian one, and maybe uh, yeah, well. we'll have another because I think Australian films are worth talking about, definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, back to Mad Max. We could talk about Mary Poppins as well, is because Dick Van Dyke's English accent is Australian, isn't it? I was curious too. In that movie, uh, you do a British accent in that movie, and I realized that I borrowed your. Whenever anybody comes on the show who's from the United Kingdom. And, and it could be anybody. It could be Dame Judi Dench. It could be Hugh Laurie. I say, hello, governor. <laughs> and they get so mad at me. And I said, I learned that from Dick Van Dyke. Oh, my God. I, if somebody from the UK sees me, they're on me like a pack of bulls. Uh, I mean, it was the worst Cockney accent ever done. But I was, the guy who taught me was an Irishman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pat O'Malley. So now I, I made up a story. I said, it wasn't Cockney. It's from a... A little obscure county in the north of England. A few Cockneys moved up there, you know, in the 1800s. And it's, you, you probably would never hear it again. So, <laughs> so you were completely lying to people. Oh, oh. So really, the British get angry when they see you. They, and and uh, do you ever give it to them right in there? That's what I've done so many times, right in their face. I go like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sweep you, your chimney you for you. Oh, I will. Oh, I will. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's. Uh, Good eye, Mary Poppins. Good eye, Mary Poppins. What are we doing tonight? <laughs> yeah. Come on, let's let's go wash some pots. Yeah, rub and if you can up. if you can wring your wring your little um, your, your cloth out, run a jay, a little bit of a root. Come on, Mary. Come on, come on, give it to me, baby. Come on, Mary, 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 Mary. <laughs> Mad yeah. Max is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you sort of spitting. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was fun. I enjoyed doing that. It's because we've got no kids here. I feel like I can yeah, be can free. Yeah, liberated. And, um, so yeah, Mad Max is yeah. I'm I don't know, to be honest. There's really not too much you can really say beyond it being such a spectacle, a fun film. It's well, it's, in, it's incredible. What the what they've achieved through it, and how oh, oh, Mark Miller's in his seventies now, isn't he? He is. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he hasn't he hasn't stopped working. Yeah. You know. Um, what do you think of Tom Hardy as Max Ratatouille? Um, I thought he was okay. Yeah, he was good. I'm not sure about the Australian accent. I don't, I don't know. He didn't really use it that much, luckily. No. But um, I think his look is very... I mean, he doesn't look Tom Hardy-ish. No, Tom Hardy is kind not. of a bit of a... More of a pre-boy, kind of a pursy lip kind of a face. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think it's... It's probably one of his better roles. Mm. He's sort of in there everything at the minute, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's coming down with the Chris the Chris Pratt syndrome of like oh yeah. people like him let's put him in everything. Um, yeah, I think Tom Hardy is being overused, but maybe that's just the way Hollywood is at the moment. They did it with. Um, I see. The thing is, there's a fear of being forgotten about. Yeah, and I think they want to just kind of keep him in our memory as much as possible. But I think he's doing all right. Yeah, no, I, this is it's a remarkable film. This is his thing. I think this is more his thing than than mm. um, than doing romantic comedies or anything like that. Yeah, especially he's, he's, he's more suited to this, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Mel Gibson was also really good at reaching out to him and uh, going to the premiere. They went to the premiere and they they kind of like just had a good chat and they talked about it. I think there was a more of a passing of the torch. They always have to do that. I think it's yeah. nice that they, that he did that. And um, so, what, what, mm. where do you see Mel Gibson's future? This is interesting. Let's talk about a bit, a bit about the uh, the reactionary bigot Mel Gibson. <laughs> he's he's had it slammed hard um, over the last ten years, and I think that his supporters, uh, the people who actually stay behind him, Robert Downey Jr. is always behind him because Mel Gibson saved his career, yeah, saved him from becoming uh, obscure in, in on Hollywood, and actually pu- pulled him out of the. And, and I think Robert Downey Jr. tried to do the same for him. Jodie Foster is a huge advocate of uh, Mel Gibson, mm. 
Um, he's a talented guy. He is. You know what I mean? The, um, you've, you've had he, a chat with him, right? Well, sort of. It wasn't really a chat. It was... Um, Skype call. It was very strange. A friend of mine was helping his friend who was developing this technology that was to go with Blu-ray discs. So, gotcha. say, if you're watching something, can you say something? It's product placement gone mad. On an ethical level, I didn't like it. But say you're watching a Bond film and he's got the latest thing, you can click on it and all of a sudden it'll come up where you can buy it. You know, it, it's, it's linked to the internet, so you're watching it on a Blu-ray disc, but you click on something, it'll come up where you can buy it. You can buy it on eBay for this. And it was the technology developed for Got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mel Gibson's company was interested in it. Icon are interested in developing that Yeah, technology. so we, I was upstairs, in because uh, my friend's a drum teacher, so we're in his um, his room, and he just had the. We were talking to him, and I was talking about movies and saying, "Oh, this technology is like that's inc- amazing." But I'm trying to remember saying to him, "It's a bit, you know, we're always moaning about product placement in films. This is like taking it to the next level." Yeah. yeah. Anyway, as we were talking, the laptop went. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he was, "Oh, sorry, I'll just get this." He clicked on it. <laughs> Mel Gibson, and me and Andy just went. <laughs> You just shut up, don't you? you yeah, like, and uh, he was like, oh, "Hi, Mel. We're expecting a call from you, kind of thing." And we're like, "And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. Hi guys, hi guys." And we're like, "Hello, Mel Gibson on on, on the laptop there." <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, and then Andy's like, and then Andy's mate just sort of like, uh, "We we should, you know, can you leave us to have a private conversation?" Yeah, yeah, okay. Bye, Mel Gibson. Th- thanks for calling me. You, you didn't say that, did you? Yeah, no. I said bye, Mel Gibson, and then just walked out of the room. Fuck! No, you didn't say that. I did. Oh I, my god! Bye, Mel Gibson. Bye, Mel Gibson. <laughs> so, you were you were lost, it man. You'd lost it. because you were such a left turn of the traffic light. So I weren't expecting. You that. Were, I know. I mean, um, what would you do? I mean, I, I I I would. I don't know. It's a it's a freaky thing, but I mean, he does have a power. There is an enigma about him. I mean, but but the idea. I mean, is he into Hollywood for making films? Or is he into just making money? I mean, is that really? I mean, is he? A, does he have a love of film? But obviously, with this venture for Icon, he, he's got more of you know he's got to think business and trying to think of you know how to keep things going. Is this a means to an end for making good films? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, because the last film I've seen him in was uh, one of the Expendables film, the last of the Expendables film, which actually he's really good in it. He plays a menacing dirtbag really well. Yeah. I think he's a good he's a good actor he and he's a, a talented actor. filmmaker for all its faults. Braveheart's technically good. Yeah, yeah. You know, The Passion of the Christ for all its faults is technically good. Apocalypto. Um, Apocalypto. I actually really enjoyed Apocalypto. Yeah, I thought it was a it's good. It's different. It's, it's, it's basically he's not. A, he was not afraid in that era since Braveheart until until everything kind of went downhill for him. He was not about to make a Hollywood make a Hollywood film. Uh, anymore, he wanted to make a film that was risky. Yeah, art house film. He took risks, absolutely, and that you got to admire. You got to admire the price that. being like a two-hour torture scene. Jeez, I, I I couldn't watch it. I actually I, I'm not very good with torture myself. Anyway, I prefer not to have it. I prefer <laughs> I prefer to avoid it when necessary. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm it's just like a unique survival plan I worked out for myself. <laughs> Don't get tortured. Yeah. Live longer. That's it. But the thing I can't watch saw films um, because I, I I don't see the point in watching them. To me, that's torture porn. Um, it is. I, and I'm not really. I didn't into mind that. the first saw film. Yeah. To, but it, it just got it got too much torture porn, and it's not really cinematic. It's not filmic. I mean, uh, what's next? Do you actually go to a place and watch people? Actually with, do it, yeah. but actually do it without with prosthetic limbs. They have to be limbless in order to kind of like then they come in and then they just chop the legs off. Yeah, it again, look. it's shock. You, you could really just go shock, shock, for shock crazy. Yeah, yeah, for shock's sake, as opposed to any having any kind of like. There's a reason in here, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. not like um, like prisoners, the Hugh Jackman film, where he's torturing a guy because he's convinced that's the person who took his kid, and mm. it hasn't. It's not the it's not the same person who's tortured him. And it's a normal guy pushed to the limit because he's lost his kid. Yeah, yeah. That then you can sort of say, right, you can see him losing it and why you do that. Yes. But not yeah. just stick, you know, there's some crazy guy who sticks people into torture devices. and Yeah. <laughs> Which is basically the sequel to Save Shades, um, Shades of Grey, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's this one I remember seeing one where he's like he's, he, all his limbs are in Whoa. these like metal cages and then they just start twisting like that 
Yeah. And you see bones start cracking out, and he's just, and it's like, ah, yeah. To be honest, I mean, no, I mean, it, it's not. I've been, I've been, I've been a, I've been an advocate of not having bones popping out of anything since watching the fly. You know, the arm wrestling bit when he just cracked the bone out of it. Yeah. Head. Yeah, I, mean, I thought I'm, I'm done. I don't need to see that anymore. When I saw them, uh, yeah, when they pulled um, John Savage, is it John Savage? I think they pulled out of the water in Deer Hunter, and oh, he had his yeah, bone yeah. contusion. And yeah. bone. anything like that, I'm squeamish about. I mean, the I, Descent. Have you seen the Descent? Uh, I'm not too sure if I remember it because That's I'm an like, amazing film. But yeah. she falls down that cabin, and then she's bones popping out of the leg, yeah. and they have to pop it back in, and then oh my god! Yeah, but anything like that, and, and still, yeah, like 27 hours. Is it 27 hours or 37 minutes? Oh he yeah, yeah. Chop his own arm off, James Franco. Because so. uh, because that became the film's main marketing thing. You know, do you want to, do you want to see a... somebody cutting his arm off? Yes, let's go watch this movie. But I guess with that, it's what a survival it? film because survival it's a film. real guy. It actually happened. Yeah, and it actually did happen. And the thing with that, he was in a lot of pain getting through is when he had to snap the tendon. That's yeah. when it like it, it looked like... It looked, they look like fun. <laughs> did not look like fun. But that that becomes the, 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 the only focusing point of a film. And I think that that's kind of not the way to go. I mean, the idea is a film about his survival. Don't make it just about, oh, that scene. We're going to mm. wait for that scene to happen because that's what all those... It's like basic instinct. Yeah, it's it's like that one scene. Building up to the beaver. We're building up to the beaver and we don't need to build up to any beavers. I mean, so, so, so. It don't work on many levels because beavers build dams. Not dams, I dams. Know, I don't know where he's going with this. I don't know where I'm going with it either. Go, 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 carry, on, carry on, I'm intrigued. No, I'm just saying that what, it works on many levels because a beaver builds dams and you can build up to a beaver. <laughs> Yeah, because there's bound to be a beaver on the top who's taking the stuff from the bottom. Yeah. Building up to the beaver. Building up to the beaver. Have we made a new expression go. now? Yeah. This is a, so, Can that be my, my line? Uh, Building up to the beaver. <laughs> yeah. You've got, like, what's yours? The clock is running. Building up to the beaver. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love it. 25%. So Mad Max. <laughs> yeah. When did they build up to the beaver in this? Um... So essentially, right, it is just a two-hour-long chase. It's a chill-long chase, but it's a journey, and it's I like that. But the thing is, they have to go back. I mean, that's the beauty of this film, is that they once they've done Fury Road, they get to the end, and they realise there's nothing there to be had. Yeah. So then the, Max goes up to uh, Charlize and says, you know what, you know where you need to go. We need to go right back to where we came from and take over the Citadel. And that's going to be the next film. And then that's what they did. They got back and they took. They haven't taken it over, but they kind oh, of yeah, arrived, yeah, yeah, they arrived back there. But they, they're making another film, aren't they? I hope so. No, they are. It's been, yeah. it's been greenlit, and George Miller is oh, doing yeah. it. Or is Mark he, Miller. I'm more is. excited about this than I am superhero films, and this is just as surface as they are in a way. Mm. But because it because it's not complicated, they haven't convoluted it with too many plot lines, too many side things. It is what it is. It's basic story and you kind of you're just there with them and that's all that matters to me I think when you're making a film like that I suppose so yeah I agree with that but I'm into the whole mythos of and that's probably what it is what you want to explore that world and you I like it I love it I love yeah. like this film is referencing mm. this and that film's referencing something that's going to happen in two yeah. years and all that kind of stuff and I like that I'm excited yeah. to see where it goes I think we're beginning to see the end of this because Ant-Man even though it was like number one it's probably the smallest opening for a Marvel film yeah the second apparently the second smallest yeah. uh, in America but uh, um, what other reviewers have actually said is that uh, regardless of how bad it does in the US it's about Europe and, and the rest of the world yeah in Asia and, and that's the reason why it's so successful because there's so many people out there who, who will watch it rewatch it and love it and they're not necessarily as 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 critical about film. The you know the mass the masses aren't really critical. They just want to go and have a goof off and watch a film and be entertained. Mm. Um, so yeah, the reason why people haven't gone to see Ant Man in America is because it's not the main feature. It's like it's like it's not Pink Floyd. You know, it's like going to see the Australian Pink Floyd. <laughs> the Australian... I'm bringing it back to Australia. See what I'm doing? <laughs> Was there an Australian Pink Floyd? Yeah, yeah, they're brilliant. Are they? Yeah, amazing. Wow. So if you can't see Pink Floyd because they'll never tour again, you could just see Pink Floyd. You just watch the Australian Pink Floyd. Is there actually a guy called Floyd who's into? No, no, it's just the Australian Pink Floyd. <laughs> Great. That's it. And they have like the massive light show and big screens and stuff, and it's an event. But we love Australia. We love Australian films, and I think that yeah. 
I think I, I'm definitely giving Mad Max Fury Road a pass. Um, I could have given it a pass before I even watched it, and that's. that's I'm going to really. give it a merit. <laughs> so I've gone better than you. Oh yeah. You've just passed it, but I give it a merit. Okay. Distinction. Fair enough. I mean, we. we no, I think it looks amazing. Um, we covered the sexuality, the gender thing. We covered the the action. Um, the the script. That's the thing about it, isn't it? That when you're watching it, it's actual people actually doing stuff. Very little CGI. Yeah. And um, what that's you, what I love in a film. Yeah. What did you think? I mean, even the powdered guy who was actually part of that collective um, gang, the, the guy who they who gets dragged along for the ride. Yeah. Even he has a story arc. Yeah. And, and, and he's yeah. interesting enough to to kind of yeah, you know, he is interesting enough to to kind of be interested in. And interesting, <laughs> yeah, in, in, interestingly interesting. Uh, and and he's you know he actually does things in here. He doesn't just blend in with the background and speak whenever he's been told to speak. You know, just then he's been given a, a boot, and he, he's just they they keep him constant in the story. They're not just uh, standing around doing nothing. Interestingly, that's Beast out of X Men. Beast out of X Men, really? Yeah, is it Summit Holt? His name? Joseph Holt. Oh, I don't know. I don't know why he was in um, what's the film with I think Hugh, he makes beer with Hugh Grant when he's a bit of a knob oh, that doesn't really narrow it down does it uh, <laughs> about a boy about a boy it's him yeah or about a boy the kid yeah that's him that's the kid yeah holy cow that's interesting there you go yeah I think we'll end on that factoid okay <laughs> <laughs> right no yeah love it great film decent more good One job more. keep going Building up to the beaver. So we're going to end on the beaver? I don't know. We start on the clock is running, we end on the beaver? Okay, but I suppose the life begins at the beaver, doesn't it? Mary, 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 Mary. 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 Ah. Building up to the Building beaver. The beaver, the beaver, the beaver. We all need that moment in our lives where we are reminded about who we are and what we are about. It can come to you as a taste, a feeling, but rarely does it become a place so tangible that it is life-changing. A place where the deadlines are made by the seasons and order thrives in the vastness of biodiversity. That place is Australia. Australia is a land where the urban culture is put in its place against a fortified landscape of beauty beyond comparison. A place that provides lessons within an unforgiving terrain. Desert, rocks, forest and coral. These are the custodians of a frontier that is crafted by evolution to an immense scale. The land is shaped impressively, as if still freshly touched by the stars that once created them. Visit Australia and see the many creatures that go their own way and yet live in harmony with each other as they encourage and influence the wisdom of Australia's people. Where else can life teach you about the challenge and reward, about trust, strength and the willingness to adapt and overcome? Find balance. Find yourself. Discover the ultimate destination. Australia.